Acts. Roxy kind of stumped me for a minute. She said Luke chapter 5, 1 through 11. I'm, like, I'm actually doing Acts chapter 5, 1 through 11. So I'm like, oh my gosh, it's the same thing. But if you have your Bibles, if you want to open up to Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, and the title of today's question is, Why Do We Lie? Now, before we talk about why we lie, I'd like to ask Miss MJ to come up for a minute here. And just so you know, I don't surprise people. I cleared it with her that I could bring her up, so you don't have to be like, oh my gosh, you're going to pull this up. But, but last week was a big weekend for uh, Miss MJ. And MJ, can you tell us what exactly was it that was going on in this picture right there? I'm sorry if I sound like I have a list, I have like bands in my mouth, but... Um I graduated from the police academy last week, and I took a picture with Chief Curley, and uh, yeah. Yay. And just to her credit, because you know I always tease her, and I told her I wasn't going to tease her today. But to her credit, she actually won the award for the most, uh, the best physical fitness test for a female cadet, correct? Yay. And so that's something that we're really excited about. And, and it's MJ's hope and prayer that maybe one day, if the Lord leads her in that direction, that she would uh, can, uh, pursue a career in law enforcement. So keep up the great work, MJ. We're really proud of you. And just to say, she was worried the whole time I was going to tease her, but I didn't. <laughs> Even though I wanted to. Um, and so congratulations on that, MJ. And then also, really, really quick, for those of you that tried to log on to Facebook yesterday to do our aerobics class, and maybe you ran into some technical difficulties, that was me. Sorry about that. I promise next week it will be better. So if you didn't have a chance to come uh, yesterday, or if you want to watch on Facebook, it's 9 a.m. Saturdays. We had like 11 people here yesterday. It was really, really cool, and I promise it will be working uh, next week. So let me ask you this. If I were to ask you, have you ever lied, what would you say? Now, some people would actually be uh, truthful and say, yes, I have. And some people would actually lie and say, no, I haven't. <laughs> now, well, honestly, what is the biggest, most common lie that people say? I've never lie. lied. I don't lie, right? <laughs> In fact, I read on hope, the hopeline.com, why do people lie exactly? They gave four reasons. Number one, to create a false belief or false impression because you want someone to think differently of yourself. Number two, fear. Fear out of what might be found out or fear out of what people might think of us if we told them the truth. Number three, manipulation. In order to get people to either do something we want them to do or don't do something we want them to do. And here's the thing that really shocked me about this one. Do you know what word is most used more than any other word when it comes to lies? Yep. The word love. And then we also lie because of punishment. In other words, avoiding being punished for something. And I won't say, because they're not here, but one of our two sons, I always knew that they were necessarily not being truthful. When I asked them, did you do something? And the answer was always, nope. That's really happy, <laughs> nope. And so even now to today, I always joke with that person and say, nope. And that, by the way, this weekend was the first time that Janine and I have actually kind of been on our own for 20 years. Riders away, Jordan's away. Let's just say we're going to be okay. Let's just say we love our boys. We love them here, but we're going to be all right. I just think we went out to breakfast yesterday, and we like sat there forever. And the lady's like, "You want more coffee?" I'm like, "Absolutely." This is the first time in 20 years we haven't had someone here. So, so, so we love you boys dearly, but we're going to be all right. Don't worry about mom and dad. But, but it's assumed that at some point in our lives, either in the past or right now, we have told lies. Some we deem major lies. And some we deem just minor white lies, they don't hurt anybody. You know those lies like, I'm on my way. <laughs> or the lie like, oh, I love that. And as soon as you leave, like, that was the most disgusting thing I've ever eaten. Or that I can't believe they did that, right? Another one, nothing is wrong, I am fine. Yeah. Right? I used to like have to like go through hours and hours with my mom. Mom, you sure everything's fine? No, I'm fine. Okay, right? Another one, right here. Uh, I will call you back or I will text you. Right? I've had people tell me, well, I'll just text you that. I'm like, wow, that's great because you don't even have my number. <laughs> right? I will call you back or I'll text you. The one that everybody knows when they say these words that nine times, well, seven times out of ten they're lying, I promise. Ten times out of ten. 
It's getting real on some people here, huh? <laughs> regardless of why we say it, regardless of what we say, regardless of how major it is, how minor it is, regardless of whether it's a white lie or I guess the opposite of major one would be a black lie, right? Regardless of what it is, church, we must understand that it is still wrong. In fact, Proverbs 19.22 says, It is better to be a poor man than a liar. In fact, studies have shown that if we're not careful and we lie, lies can actually become very a, addictive in our lives. And actually, they can lead to addictions in our lives because the more we lie, the more we have to cover up. And it gets so stressful that it can cause us into addictions to try to hide our pain. But if you think about it, every addiction, every addiction, regardless of what it is, is based upon, built upon, created by, protected by lies. So if we allow lies to get out of control, they can become addictive. They can also become destructive. The more you lie, the more you have to work to keep them all straight. And finally, we also know that lies can ruin relationships. Now, I'm sure what I told you is not like big shocking news, like, oh my gosh, I never knew that. I'm sure it's like, wow, I know I did it, but I didn't realize it was that bad. But my question for you is this. Knowing that lies are so damaging, so hurtful, so destructive, they are wrong, they always cause pain and suffering, why do we lie? That's what we're going to look at today in this passage. And we're going to study what is the root cause that, not forces us, that allows us and enables us to lie, even though we know it's wrong, even though we know it's bad, and even though it knows, we know it causes pain. So if you'd like to stand, we're going to read verses 1 through 11 in Acts chapter 5. And beginning in verse 1 it says, but a certain man named Aeneas, with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, And Aeneas, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias heard these words, fell down, and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in, found her dead, and carried her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. You can go and have a seat. And Lord... We just thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that your word speaks truth into our life. And Lord, I ask and I pray that this message would touch us today, Lord. Lord, we know your word does not condemn us, but it convicts us. And Lord, I pray for those that, that struggle with this topic today. Lord, may you give us strength to do what's right. May you give us courage to say what's right. In Jesus' glorious and mighty name we pray. Amen. Now, to kind of put things in perspective, last week at the end of chapter 4, we were talking about uni unity, community, generosity. And a lot has happened from the end of chapter 4 to the beginning of chapter 5. Because that unity and community and generosity, as we see here in the, verse, the first five verses, have been uh, replaced with deceit, darkness, and hypocrisy. Now, I have to tell you, I really struggled with this topic this week about what I wanted to say. Because, you know, I think there's enough messages out there 
that talk about how and why lying is a sin. I think there's enough messages out there that talk about the damage and destruction and the consequences of lying. And quite honestly, I didn't want to just do another word or another message online, but I wanted to make it meaningful to us. I wanted to make it applicable to us. And that's why I chose the, co the topic of why on earth do we lie anyway? Now, before we get on, I do want to make sure we're all on, on the same page about lying. Number one, lying is a sin. There's no such thing as a good lie. And what is a lie? Lie is saying something that is untrue, false, a misleading statement with the intent to deceive. That's why in 1 John 1, 8 it says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. In other words, what John is saying right there is that if we lie, really the only person we are deceiving is ourself. And the truth is not in us. So we know that it's a sin. We know that lying hurts those around us and ultimately lying will always hurt us. We know that lying always gets found out. And if you don't believe me, just ask all the big shot executives from Enron that got busted and got sent to prison. It always gets caught. It always gets found out. And then finally, we must know that lying always has consequences. But if we know all this, if we agree on all this, then why do we lie? That's the exact question that the apostles asked Ananias and Sapphira. Why did you lie to us about this? What started out as a kind act on the behalf of these two people ended up causing death in both of their lives. So why do we lie? Well, one of the reasons why we, we know that people lie is because point one, it is always premeditated. In fact, here's what I think a lie is. Lying is our public acknowledgement that we know that what we're doing, what we're saying, where we're going, who we're meeting with, whatever, is actually wrong. And when we actually lie about it, we are admitting to people that we know it's wrong. Because if we didn't think it was wrong, if we didn't believe it was wrong, if we didn't think we were hanging out with the wrong people, we wouldn't have to lie about it, right? We would be very truthful. So when we lie, we are publicly acknowledging to everybody, including God and ourselves, that we know what we are doing, saying, going, talking to, whatever is wrong. Remember the story of uh, Abraham and Sarah in Genesis 12. Why is it premeditated? Abraham's like, hey, I got a great idea. I got a great idea, Sarah. Here's what we're going to do. You know, you're a good looking woman. And I know that the Pharaoh and everybody's going to like you. And I know if they like you so much, they're going to want to kill me to get to you. So I love you. You're my wife. But let's do this. Let's just for the heck of it, let's, just, let's say you're my sister. All right. And, and you, you can go get married with the Pharaoh. But really, I'm going to save my life. The lie was premeditated. And by the way, man, that, that is going to be like a Father's Day or a Husband Day message, right? Give up your life to save your wife. Or give up your wife to save your life. <laughs> but that's exactly what happened here between this husband and wife. It says here in verse 2, And they kept back part of the proceeds, and his wife was also aware of it. That didn't just happen. They obviously discussed it, they planned it, and they both were okay with it. See, so much why lying takes on premeditation is this, because before we have the conversation with anybody else about our lie, we have to first have that conversation with ourselves. We have to prepare ourselves for it, we have to plan for it, and then we have to be able to justify it in our own lives. You know, you don't just think, well, you gotta work through it. Okay, I'm gonna say that I wasn't going 45, that my speedometer's broken. I actually think I was doing 35. No, that's not going to work. I'm going to say that I was just praying. You know, and so once we get comfortable with the excuse, the lie that we are having, we are then ready to say it to someone. We don't just make up. We're not that smart, kids. We have to predetermine what we're going to say before we say it to someone else. We have to go through all the scenarios to make sure there's no, you know, no, that's good, that's good. They can't get me there, right? That's what I'm saying. Lying takes a lot of work. And some of us just aren't smart enough. 
But it always requires that it's predetermined. When you say a lie, if you say a lie, it doesn't just happen. You thought it through, you planned it, you prepared it, and you are presenting your best case that you hope and pray to the dear Lord. Nobody catches you, nobody can put a, put a hole in it. But it was predetermined here, and they asked him, why did you lie? It's obviously that they discussed it and agreed upon it before they did it. That's what we're talking about in True Love Section 2 with Adam and Eve. didn't just happen. We don't know much about it, but we know it didn't just happen. Eve, Eve ate the fruit, and then Adam ate the fruit. They obviously thought it was made sense to do. They agreed upon it, and they both did it. it uh, excuse me. Lies are the sin. But in order for us to understand why we lie, we have to understand what causes us to sin. See, when I counsel people about a particular sin in their life, you know, they always come and they go, you know, we want to talk about the, the sin. And I'm like, well, I don't want to talk about the sin. Because the sin is just the acting out of the big issue. I want to get to the big issue. Same thing with lying. Lying is just the acting out of a bigger issue. And we have to understand and get to the root cause of what that bigger issue is. If we don't get to the root cause of what that bigger issue is, then we will never, ever be able to stop sinning in our lives. Because by the time we sin, we have justified it in our lives, we have prepared it, and we've accepted it. Not just in our mind, but in our heart. That's why I always tell you, when I hear words coming out of people's mouths, I'm not concerned about their mouths. I'm concerned about their hearts. Because the heart is the gateway of what comes out of our mouths. Lies will work until we are shocked back into reality. And I don't know why we always seem to be shocked when a lie gets caught or when the truth is revealed. It's like we never saw that coming. Like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that. But you have to understand, lies will always get caught at some point. And then the truth will always shock us back into reality. In other words, hear what I think lies are. Lies today only delay the pain that comes tomorrow. If I lie today and I can withhold punishment or pain today, thank you, Jesus. But we have to understand that that punishment, that pain, that consequence will come. Maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day. But it will always come. You know, I sometimes talk to people that are... Uh, caught up in the midst of sin, whatever the sin is. And, and they almost have this kind of this bragging, right? Like, you know, nobody knows what's going on. This is great. And I always tell them, nobody knows today. But have you thought about what you're going to do when they find out tomorrow? Oh, no, it's going to be fine. Don't worry. I got this all worked out. <clears throat> then I run into them. You wouldn't believe what happened. My life has been destroyed. Lies today only delay the pain till tomorrow. And for those that are trying to justify lies and are living in lies right now, trying to accept lies, remember this. Regardless of what it is, regardless of whether or not it is a big lie or a small lie, a black lie or a, light, a white lie, a good lie or a bad lie, you will never be able to justify lying in your life. And it says right here in verse 2, And they brought a certain part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Wouldn't that be great, you know? Big fanfare, here you go, apostles, thank you so much. Why do we lie? Well, we lie because when, we, when it's premeditated, and then we lie because it's prideful. 
This couple brought their offering to the apostles and gave it to them. And why would they be prideful? Because they wanted everybody to think that they were just like everybody else. Remember in chapter 4, people were selling stuff and giving all the proceeds to the apostles to do with what they wanted with for the church. This guy was like, hey, this is genius. We're going to sell it. We ended up knowing it's land. We're going to sell this land. We're going to give a portion to the apostles, and we're going to keep a portion for us. Why is that genius? Everybody is going to think we are just like everybody else. We're going to get the same credit. We're going to get the same recognition. We're going to get the same acknowledgement that everybody else does. You know, it's like you go to these companies, they have fundraisers. You can be like the, the, the president circle, the gold circle, and this and that, right? They wanted to be in the apostle circle of the church. So they wanted everybody to think like, God bless this couple. They had this land, they sold it, and they gave everybody, everything to the church. But they didn't. They sold their property. They gave a portion to the church. And they kept a portion for themselves. Now, pride gets us to be or want to be just like everybody else. But hear my heart, church. God doesn't call us to be just like everybody else. God just calls us to be the best person we can be with all that he has given us. We will never be able to keep up with the Joneses, nor should we ever want to be just like the Joneses. I was telling everybody because we talked about pride and true love. Man, I would go nuts if the whole church was like me. I would go nuts if everybody in society was like me. We need to recognize and accept our differences, take the skills and talents that God has given us, and use them to the best of our abilities for His purposes, not our own. But they wanted to be just like everybody else. They wanted to be recognized just like everybody else. They wanted to be treated just like everybody else. So they comprised this lie and they executed this lie. And they brought their proceeds, half of their proceeds, and they laid it at the apostles' feet. But what did the apostles say? Why did you do this? They said, in verse 4, he said, While it remained, was it not your own? In other words, it was your property, right? Yeah, it was our property. Okay. And, and then, and after it was sold, the money was in your control, right? Oh, yeah, I had it all. Yeah, yeah. Deposited at the you know, first interstate of Jerusalem or whatever. First bank of Jerusalem. Yeah, it was all my money. Okay, so let me get this straight. If it was your property, and if it was your money, then why would you lie about it? See, church, what they should have said was this. They should have gone to the apostles and say, hey, you know, God blessed us with some dirt, and we decided to sell the dirt, and we want to bless the church with half of what we made. Because, you know, Let's be real. We have needs. You know, we got taxes. You know, interest rates are going up. Cost of living is going up. So we have needs that we have to take care of. But we wanted to bless God with a portion of the proceeds. That's all they had to say. And the apostles would have been, hey, thank you, Jesus. We appreciate it. But they chose to lie. They chose to present themselves as something they weren't. And it was being driven by pride. Pride's a funny thing. Pride will get us to lie, and then it's pride that we use to defend our lies. Pride will get us to be to do a flat-out denial. I did not do that. I did not say that. I did not go there. I did not whatever. It just showed up on my phone. I don't know how it got there. Pride will get us to do flat-out deflection. Did you lie to me? I don't have to tell you what I did. Did you take that from me? I don't have to tell you what I've done or haven't done. Pride gets us to blame. This is the best one, right? Did you lie to me? Well, if you want to set or did what you did, I wouldn't have had to set or do what I did, right? But it's all being driven by pride in our hearts. Pride always leads us into flat-out destruction. That's what it says here in verse 5. Then Ananias, hearing these words fell down and breathed his last breath. How does pride get us to lie? Because pride ultimately puts ourselves, our own needs, and quite honestly, our own priority above God. 
In other words, we make ourselves think that we are more important than God himself. Because the reality here was they didn't lie to people. They lied to God. And they didn't withhold from people. They withheld from God. <coughs> Church, if we can't be authentic in what we say, we will never be authentic in what we do. You know, we have this, I don't know why we have, again, I think it's the, the, the enemy and everything going on, but we have this thought that I may be a liar, but I'm trustworthy. Like, you don't necessarily have to believe what I say, but you can always trust what I do. It's like what the parents said, you know, don't do as I do, don't say, wait, don't do as I do, or whatever, you know. Don't do as I say, right? Right? If you can't trust what I say, then, oh dear God, please don't ever trust what I do. Because we don't have the capability to have a good side and a bad side to us. And that's why it just breaks my heart when I hear of pastors that get caught up in stuff. I heard another, I read another one last week. The guy I love, I, I used to listen to him all the time. They get caught up in some lies and finally got caught. Lost his whole ministry. And why do churches take that so important when a pastor gets caught up in lies and stuff? Because church, if you can't believe what I say, then you cannot believe what I do and I cannot follow, I cannot lead this church. That's why in James 3, 1 it says, for those of you that teach, you will be judged more stricter. We have to stop fooling ourselves that we can be a, a liar, I hate to say that word, we can be a liar, but we can be a good, upstanding citizen. We can be trustworthy. Our words will always, always, always dictate our actions. But we don't lie to people, church. Ultimately, we lie to God. I like the way he said it here. Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. You ever thought about that? Have you ever thought that when we lie, we actually lie to God and not to people? What does God think about lying? Well, Proverbs 19.22 says, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. PK's version of the Bible, Proverbs 19.22, God hates lying. When we lie to people, we lie to God. And when we lie to God, it says that He absolutely hates it. So why do we lie? Point one, because we think it's, uh, because it's premeditated, because it's prideful. And then we get this foolish idea, point two, three, that we think it is profitable. We falsely believe that we will benefit from lying. Well, what do we benefit? Number one, do we benefit, uh, do we gain financially? You know, I'm just going to, I'm going to cheat on stuff. I'm going to hold back stuff. I think I told you the story. We had it, went to an accountant once, and they're like, you know, first pay me $300, and we'll give you some fake receipts. And then if the IRS questions us, here's what we're going to say. If the IRS questions, I pretty much guarantee I'm not going to find you. Right? <laughs> but how many of us, you know what's scary? We got that person from a friend of ours. we have been going to them for years. How many of us cheat on our taxes because we say, I pay the government too much money? See, we justify in our own mind. You know, it's okay for me to do this because we pay the government too much. If you don't want to pay too much taxes, this isn't political. If you don't want to pay taxes, then don't vote the people in that want to keep raising our taxes. But if the government says we owe taxes, we must pay taxes. Same thing with tithing. We come in and we make all the excuses, reasons, justifications in the world why we can't tithe. God, you know, you know my situation, God, I just can't do it, sorry. We hold back like this couple, what is God's? And we justify in our mind that it's ours. And we get very comfortable with that. Janine and I, we were at church one time and the pastor gave a message on tithing. 
Nobody ever told us, seriously, the tithing was at least 10%. Nobody ever told us that it was required, it was not an option. And I can tell you that message, that Sunday, changed our lives forever. And since that Sunday, we have at least tied 10% to any church we went to because it is biblical and it is what God expects from us. Yeah, we used to, oh God, I had a great vacation. Sorry about that, God. When we don't tithe, we hold back from God. And see, here's the key. When we don't tithe, we actually hold back benefits from us. See, as, as an individual, as a pastor, I'm required to tithe here at the church. And Pastor Ruben knows this. Thank you, Jesus. With our denomination, we also get to tithe to the denomination. But with the denomination, we don't get to set the price. They set it for us. And they're really good at it. They just say, give us the credit card. We'll bill you every month. Well, thank you, Jesus, for that. And I asked him, I said, well, I question, question. Because, you know, sometimes I get paid, sometimes I don't get paid. Do I not have to pay the tithe on the times I don't get paid? Yes, you still have a, we still have a credit card, right? But see, here's the deal. If I don't tithe the denomination, then I get blessings withheld from me. If I try to go and renew my license at the end of the year, First thing they check, have you tithed? If I haven't tithed, they say, hey, we will renew your license as soon as you catch up on your tithing. If I want to receive some of the other blessings and benefits that come from being part of our denomination, they will always say, we would love to bless you, we would love to help you as soon as you catch up on your tithe. See, when I don't tithe to the denomination, blessings are withheld from me. When we don't tithe to God, blessings are withheld, withheld from us as well. I know that doesn't make sense, but it's true. And the problem is, is when we begin to justify this, when we begin to lie, when we begin to think that we're going to become, make some profit out of it, what happens is the greed, the greed that drove us to lie is the greed that withholds the blessing from us. Do you realize when we lie, when we withhold, we end up gaining less than we would have if we would have just been truthful? Why? Because they said here, right here, we withhold from God. What does Job say? The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. God gives us. But he says, I want some of it back. Not because I need it. I love churches. God doesn't need your tithes. We need your tithes, just so we're clear. I'm not part of that denomination. All right, we need your tithes. But here's the deal. God gives us things, and He expects that us to give some of it back. And when we don't, He learns that He cannot trust us with what He gave us. That's when you get the unexpected bills. That's when you get this or whatever. But it's not just money, church. God expects us to give of our talents and our skills as well. And so many people, we try to justify it and say, well, you know, I don't, I don't tithe, but I do a lot of work. We can't replace tithing with sacrifice. God wants both. If that were the case, no pastor would ever have to tithe. But yet it's in my contract that I will tithe at least 10% to this church and I will tithe to the denomination. Tithing is just acknowledging and recognizing God for the blessing that He has given in our lives. And when we start to withhold things from Him, when we start to lie to God and justify why we can't give of our time, why we can't give of the, the boxes, why we can't give of our money, whatever it is, then God begins to say, that's fine. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. You know, I don't know if there's a study, but I would suspect that if you looked at all of the ways that people tried to profit from their lies, that they ended up with less than if they would have just been truthful. How many people are in prison right now because they lied for financial gain? How many people are on the street because they lied to get some type of gain? 
It's interesting, the first two deaths in the Christian church in the New Testament are a result of lying. Now, don't worry. Just because we lie, it doesn't mean that God's going to come strike us down. Not physically, at least. But every time we lie, we suffer a little bit of a spiritual death. Why? Because every time we lie, we put a barrier between us and God. And every time we put a barrier, we get a little bit more distance from Him. We don't hear Him as well. We don't feel Him as well. We don't follow Him so good anymore. For the church in Acts, and it's interesting, these, these 11 verses, right before we had some great stuff going on, and actually, we're going to find next week we got great stuff going on again. But for this church, this church in Acts, this was a wake-up call, a reminder that we must stay faithful, obedient, honest, and true to our Word and to God's Word. And so for us today, wherever we are, today is a wake-up call. Are we living a life? Are we saying things that honor God, honor our family, honor our church? Or is our life just one big lie that we think we can get away with, that we think we can justify, that we think that it is right? And I almost said, Scott, Scott, if you want to come up here, Scott. <laughs> Church, today really is a wake-up call for all. Scott is here. <laughs> I didn't know I had that kind of power. <laughs> uh, Sting, Sting, you want to come on up here? Church, today is a wake-up call. I mean, hear my heart. I'm not here to convict you. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm not here to tell you I've never lied. I'm here to tell you I have paid some pretty cut stuff, tough, stiff consequences for my life. And I am here to tell you I've caused a lot of pain in people's lives because of my lies. And I'm here to tell you it's so much easier telling the truth. Doesn't mean you still don't get in trouble. But it sure seems like the pain goes away a lot faster. So where are you? Are you living a life that you know isn't true, that isn't right, that isn't honest? And have you been so deceived by the enemy that you've justified it in your life, in your mind, that you think it's okay? Or are you giving everything you have, everything you are to God? Through your thoughts, your words, your actions. Church, that's what I want to leave you with today. Is there any part of your life that you are withholding from God? See, we always think that we're, you know, we're, we're tricking people around us and we're tricking God. God knows exactly where we are. And the sad part is, is when we lie, everybody else knows us that as well. I used to have a friend in, in well, sorry, I'll hold him, junior high, not that middle school stuff you guys have nowadays. <laughs> and it was crazy. Like, I mean, you bring up a topic, he did it. All been there, done that. And I'm like, wow, man, you are so cool. And, and we believed the lies for a while. And I remember one time I went up skiing with my, my best friend in Mammoth. And we were just learning how to ski, and there's different classes. And there's class A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? So the way it works is the beginner's class is A, and, you know, B is a little bit better, C is a little better, you know, so you want to go down the alphabet, not necessarily up the alphabet. So we go back to school, and we're talking to this guy, and we're like, man, we went skiing. Oh, I go skiing a mammoth all the time. You do? Have you ever taken classes? Yeah. Or, and at this point, we don't know he's a liar. Oh, yeah, yeah, all the time. Really? What class you in? Oh, A, the best. 
<laughs> Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> so then we start just setting them up. We just start messing with them. <laughs> we think we fool people. But I think sometimes the only person we're fooling is ourselves. And if we were honest with ourselves, we really don't fool ourselves either, do we? If we fooled ourselves and if we were comfortable with our lives, then we wouldn't stay up all night worrying about whether or not we're going to get caught. We wouldn't worry about whether or not we're going to get fired from our job. We wouldn't worry about whether or not the IRS was going to audit us. Apparently, they don't audit anymore, by the way. Less than 1%. We wouldn't Lying will always bring destruction into your life. There's no good way to say that. It will never benefit you. It will never benefit those around you. It will always cause pain. And it will always hurt the people you love most. And remember, I won't say the next time you lie, because then that's just encouraging you to lie. I don't want to do that. If you ever say another lie, remember this. The moment you say it, you are publicly acknowledging to everybody around you that what you're saying is incorrect. See, there's very little in life that we can, we can hold on to. People can take our money, they can take our things, but they can never take our integrity and our character. That's why in this church, I tell you, pastors get caught up in, and they get tripped up in all the financial stuff. That's why I don't know who ties in this church. I never will. I don't care. I don't have the checkbook. Because it's that important to me that everybody understands that we honor and we follow God. So where are you right now? Are you living a life that you can be proud of? Or are there areas in your life that you know you could be better? See, I want today to be a, a message of encouragement, not discouragement. You know, every week in, in True Love, we, we, we're giving up things to get closer to God. And I ask everybody, how'd you do? And I think it's a great answer. Him, all right, most of the time it's, mm, ish, I'm ish a little bit. Have a good day and a bad day. And I say, you know what's so cool about that? You're beginning to recognize when you have a good day and you're beginning to recognize when you have a bad day. And when we start recognizing that we're having bad days, then we can do something about it. Church, that's what I want today. If you recognize that you have trouble telling the truth, if you recognize that there are things in your life that you're trying to cover up, today is the day to start recognizing it and doing something about it. No, we can't take back the lie we said yesterday, but we can prevent ourselves from telling a lie today or tomorrow. And that's all I want here. I want to make us better Christians. I want to make us a better church family. And I want to make us a better church. So Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth. And Lord, I ask and I pray right now for those people that may feel convicted by this message. Lord, may you encourage them and may you comfort them. Lord, as you said, there is no condemnation in you. And Lord, if there's anybody out there that, that this word has just fell, fallen upon deaf ears, Lord, I ask and I pray that you would continue to speak to them and talk to them. Lord, I pray for their eyes to be open, their hearts to be open. Lord, I pray that there would be change in their life. Lord, may we break free from the bondage of lying in our lives. May we live in the freedom of truth. Because, Lord, we know that through truth comes peace and joy. So, Lord, may our lives be filled with peace. May it be filled with joy. 
Lord, even as we go into this time of worship, may you work on people. May you touch people, Lord. May you speak to people. As we pray, as we sing at the beginning, Lord, give us wisdom because you know what to do. Lord, you know the traps we've gotten ourselves into. You know the holes that we've buried ourselves in. But Lord, we come to you asking for wisdom because only you know what to do, Lord. And Lord, for those that are ready, Lord, we're sorry. We're sorry that we have lied to you. We are sorry that we have withheld from you. Lord, may we have the strength to take a step of faith. May we live a pure, prideless, honest life for you. May all our words, may all our actions, may all our thoughts be pleasing to you. May they bring you joy. In Jesus' glorious and awesome in mighty name we pray. Amen. Now we're going to start worship here, another song. If you want to have prayer, please come on up. We'd love to pray for you. God bless you guys. Have a great week.